Um, here's an agenda. We'll briefly talk about ECAP. Um, I'm going to mention what happened with uh, the Biden and Harris cancellation, which probably you've all heard. I'm going to go quickly over some key dates that you should know and highlight some things that you should do before payments resume. And then we're going to dive in and spend most of our training on um, managing parent plus loans, things that I really hope are useful for you to put into perspective and hopefully end up um, thinking about the strategy that you're going to take. Um, I'm going to talk in, in that portion, um, you know, figuring out your strategy, discuss some forgiveness cancellations that we see are common for parent plus loan borrowers, repayment options, and then, um, you know, how do we keep this loans in good standing? We're briefly going to talk about private student loans because I recognize that um, a significant number of uh, parent borrowers are also taking out private loans. I'm going to touch on bankruptcy literally one slide. Uh, we always, um, you know, if you have private loans and want a one on one counseling session, we're also happy to do that and, and see what your situation is like. And then at the end, you're going to have some resources. So here's our contact information. You're going to have our contact information and you're going to have a copy of this PowerPoint. We're going to send it along with a recording after the fact. This is everything we do. As I mentioned, we are a program of the Community Service Society of New York, which is a longstanding nonprofit organization. And in, in essence, our entire goal is to help student loan borrowers in New York State manage and whenever possible eliminate student loan debt. So we engage in different activities from helping borrowers explore forgiveness programs to helping them um, get loans out of, out of default if they have any in, in default. Um, into good standing and, and an array of other things. We do have a network of community-based organizations providing the same services. So you have a map there and you can go to our website and see who our partners are in case you wanted local assistance. Otherwise, you can always call our helpline and get one-on-one -on -one help that way. So let's talk really quickly about the Biden and Harris cancellation. The Supreme Court struck down this initiative that would cancel up to 20,000 for federal student loan borrowers. So that is not happening. Uh, President Biden announced um, an additional approach through the uh, HIA Higher Education Act. Um, that is going to be in the works. It's going to take some time. And we don't believe it's going to be like broad based cancellation as the Biden and Harris cancellation proposal that again got struck um, by the Supreme Court. We want to highlight and emphasize that that Supreme Court decision does not impact other forgiveness programs that are listed there, for example, and some of which we're going to highlight today. All those programs are kind of like longstanding programs that you can still pursue if you qualify for them to tackle your debt. In all honesty, there are so many other changes and programs currently available that for many borrowers, 10 and 20,000 was going to do very little, not to say that we disregard it, but all these other initiatives might help you wipe out your entire debt if you're eligible for them. Moving on, key dates to know now that we have um, more information on what's happening. So recently there was announced a new plan called SAVE. Um, unfortunately, Parent PLUS loans were excluded from this. I'm gonna talk more about it, but I wanted to give you a heads up. If you have both Parent PLUS loans and your own debt, you should definitely reach out to us because we wanna figure out what's the best approach because you may have an opportunity to pay your own loans under the SAFE plan potentially and your parent plus loans under an income contingent repayment plan, depending on your strategy. Uh, interest is gonna begin accruing on federal loans starting September. The first payment is not gonna be due until October. The exact date is gonna be based on your specific situation. If you're repaying your federal student loans prior to the COVID pause, you can anticipate that your due date is gonna be the same. Uh, we'll talk about some strategies there. Uh, December 31st, this is a big one and it's hard for us to really transmit all this information, but if you have older loans, FFEL loans in particular, meaning your loans are still with Navian, AES, or your loans didn't benefit from the payment pause, you should look into consolidating them and converting them into direct loan because there's other benefits to doing that. Um, in 2024, we're going to hear about this IDR account adjustment, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and then for those people who may have loans in default, they could benefit from an initiative called Fresh Start to get the loans back in good standing all the way to 2024. So this is just an overview. An additional thing that just came out last week was a 12-month unwrapped 
unramping for repayment. So the current administration acknowledges that getting 43 to 45 million student loan borrowers back into repayment is going to be a hurdle and that some people may fall behind and not be in tune and not pay. So rather than reporting those uh, as delinquencies to the credit bureaus, the current administration is going to give more or less like a free pass. They're not going to report delinquency and defaults for the first 12 months after repayments resume. However, interest is going to start accumulating and any month that you do not actively pay is not going to count for forgiveness programs like the public service loan forgiveness and the income driven repayment forgiveness. Again, those are two programs we're going to discuss more. In general, we highly encourage people to be ready to repay and have the right repayment plan by, by October, but rest assured that if you miss a payment, at least for the first 12 months, you're not gonna be reported to the credit bureaus. Student loan repayment checklist. This is kind of an overview. We actually have an entire toolkit on our website and we provide the link there that you can look into that it's gonna address and provide more information about this checklist under each one. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure that studentaid.gov, which is the national student loan database the government um, manages, has your updated contact information. Again, on our website, we have a, a short video on how to update your contact information on studentaid.gov. If you don't know who your student loan servicer is right now, you need to find out. You can find out through studentaid.gov. You go to your dashboard, you'll be able to see your student loan servicer on the right-hand corner, or you can scroll down and find that information. The reason why you want to uh, have access to your student loan servicer is because they're the ones that are going to directly be communicating about your first payment, how much it's going to be, and the due date. So you want to make sure you know who your student loan servicer is, have an account with them, and make sure that they also have updated contact information. You want to make sure that you're enrolled in the right repayment plan. If you don't know what repayment plan you are enrolled in, you can find out. If you need help exploring your repayment plan options, um, you know, reach out to us. We can help you. And I'm going to be talking more about repayment plan options for Parent PLUS loans. So that may give you a little bit more information in terms of which way to go. You should know when your payment amount will be and the due date. Again, you can either be proactive. If you're really anxious, you could call your servicer and get a little bit more details on what that may be. Or you can wait for your first invoice. Your first invoice uh, should arrive probably at some point next month or September, but no later than 21 days before your first payment is due. Um, I apologize for any noise. Give me one second and I can send a message um, to see if they can stop. Okay. Uh, be ready to make your monthly payments. And what I mean by that is if you had auto debit, you would have to reestablish it with your student loan servicer. If you had set up an account, um, before COVID, your chances are you're still going to have to set it up because things might have changed. So you want to verify that you're ready to make payments. Um, and if things go wrong, you want to escalate. We're always here in case you need to file a complaint or you're reaching out to your servicer and you're not getting the right information. Uh, going back to be ready to make monthly payments, again, be aware that there's a 12-month on-ramp but you should really be ready to be in an affordable repayment plan. I recognize that for some of you, there might be no affordable repayment plan. So at that point, I encourage you to reach out to us because we need to figure out a long-term strategy. So diving into Parent PLUS loans, quick overview. So Parent PLUS loans are actually federal loans given out to parents to help finance their dependents, usually their children's undergraduate studies. Parent PLUS loans are not available for graduate studies of a dependence education. It is only for undergrad. Now, the thing to understand is that there are actually limits for undergrad borrowing. So if your son, daughter, your dependent went to college, they could borrow in general up to $31,000. So the rest was available to you as a Parent PLUS loan. Now, Parent PLUS loans, unfortunately, have the highest interest rate of all the federal loans available, which is really unfortunate. To be honest, I don't know who was thinking that we could place this burden on you as a parent and give you the highest payment or the highest interest rate and the worst repayment plan options. But that is the case. 
The other thing about Parent Plus loans is that there is de facto no credit check. So it's very easy for people to get a high loan balance in Parent Plus without realizing that they might not be able to repay it, uh, even with uh, different repayment plan options. The other thing that complicates things is that you can technically borrow up to the cost of uh, your dependents' um, college education minus any aid um, and loans that they take out. So that could be pretty steep depending on the school you go or your dependent goes like for profits. This is all stuff that you probably already know, but I just wanted to put it into perspective. At the end of the day, Parent PLUS loans are your legal responsibility and technically there is no way within the federal system for you to assign your loans to a dependent. If you're pursuing a forgiveness program, it's going to be based on your circumstances, so not your dependents. So if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness, you're the one that is supposed to be working or, or would be required to be working in the public sector and accumulate the 120 qualifying payments and all that. Um, the good thing is that Parent PLUS loans are dischargeable upon death, and I wish I could be joking about this, but that is a conversation I'm having with a lot of my Parent PLUS loan borrowers who are near retirement or in retirement, and the balance is just so high that it, you know they'll realistically never be able to repay it back. Um, let's take a quick look at this repayment metrics. Uh, again, this is just going over what I already covered, the fact that the student borrower can only get up to 31000 as a general cap in uh, federal student loans. As a result, you end up with uh, parent plus loans, which tend to have a higher interest rate. But even uh, parent plus loans might not be as bad as private loans. Sometimes the colleges can also offer loans to the student borrower with a co-signer. Once you enter the private loan arena, the lender wants their money and you're going to have a predetermined payback period. The other thing for you to know is whether it's federal loan or parent plus loans, you can start repayment right after disbursement for federal 60 days after disbursement. For private, you can elect to start paying them as soon as you take them out, but most people tend to defer. And when you're deferring for four years, interest is accumulating. So all of a sudden you end up with a lot more money than you anticipated. I'm going to stop there to see if there's any questions or Nancy, if you want to add anything before we we continue with the presentation. Um, well, there was just one question, and it um, if I understood it correctly, it revolved around whether or not you can pay off your Parent PLUS loans, um, I guess, in, in one payment. So I'll just reiterate that um, you can pay your entire balance. Uh, if your loans are in good standing at any time without penalty, meaning that they're not going to charge you like future interest that hasn't accumulated already, whatever the balance is, if you can and are willing to pay it off in one lump sum, you can do that. What you can't do, though, is negotiate a settlement for less than the, the balance at the time, unless you're in default and you would probably have to be in default for a long time. And even then, there's no guarantee uh, that the government would settle. Um, so that's that's uh, the one question. I don't know, Carolina, did you have something to say about that? <laughs> well, I think you're right and spot on. I think we sometimes get clients that say, like, I can pay in a lump sum. Sometimes they'll dip into the retirement account, which is another conversation because there's penalties if you're not in retirement and when there's a host of issues. But um, sometimes we get inquiries about, can you help me like settle this? And if the loans are in good standing, there's no reason why the federal government or a, or a private lender is going to want to settle. Your loans are in good standing. That shows ability to, to repay. So there's no incentive for them to try to um, accept less than what you owe. So yeah, keep that in mind. Definitely no, no prepayment penalty at any point. You can pay additional payments monthly or you can pay lump sums at any time. Okay, um, yes. Oh, sorry, there was just one one other thing and I, I, I don't remember whether you're gonna address this later, but um, you mentioned the uh, the issue of, of parent borrowers being in deferment um, and that causing uh, interest to accrue unnecessarily. The other thing that deferment may do if you're a parent borrower is it's going to, you, you cannot get credit towards forgiveness programs. So if you're eligible for public service loan forgiveness or something called IDR forgiveness, which Carolina is gonna talk about a little bit later, if you're in deferment, uh, you're not going to make any headway towards those programs. So that's something to consider strategically when you're when you're thinking about managing your your parent plus loans. Yep. Thank you. 
So I'm going to discuss three strategies, and these strategies uh, are based on our experience. So I should know that like all we do day in, day out is actually work with student loan borrowers. So we're kind of a unique program that that's all we do. So I hope that these strategies uh, reflect our experience or the consumer experience. So one of the things that I find and we find in our practice is that a lot of people, you know, get the sticker shock when they have to start repaying. And it's a question of like enrolling the plan that I can afford without really stepping back and thinking about, well, what's my strategy with this debt? I think a lot of us intuitively think that your strategy is to repay it, but there is a second question to that, and that is ability to repay. Can you realistically repay it? And if so, how long is it going to take? And so forth. So I'm going to cover the strategies. Um, you can always revisit your strategy. I always joke that what if you win the lotto? Like, and then you might have money and repay it. So you might want to come back and, and think about it. So um, the, every person's circumstances are going to be different. So keep this in mind. Again, these are just big picture. One of them is the easiest one to explain, and that is pay off the debt as quickly as possible. As we mentioned, there is no prepayment penalty. So technically, you can enroll in a repayment plan that let's say you're comfortable with, but if your goal is to pay off this debt, you would do it like aggressively. And um, treat it like credit card debt. The faster you pay, the more you're going to save in interest, and the quicker you're going to be done with it. I recognize that this is only going to work for people who have like a low or manageable loan balance comparison to their income. So meaning they're moderate to high income earners and their loan balance is manageable. Keep in mind the interest rate, chances are this is a high interest rate. Sometimes if you're going to be making lump sum payments, if you're also paying credit card debt, you want to be strategic on what you're paying off first. So that's kind of like a, a big pointer there. The second one is explore your forgiveness options. There's def different federal forgiveness programs, which I'll talk about. And the strategy there would likely be if required, enrolled in the required repayment plan and then pay the required amount until you achieve forgiveness, right? So if you're going to be pursuing a forgiveness program, there is no incentive or need to try to pay aggressively, right? Because the end goal is I don't care if my loans go up because I may not be making payments that cover the entire interest, for example, but that's okay because I know that I'm gonna get forgiveness in 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, whatever that case may be. For parent plus loans, which I'll talk about, if you're not pursuing public service loan forgiveness, it's gonna be 25 years under another program called the Income Driven Repayment Forgiveness. And then um, the last strategy, which I alluded to earlier, and I know it can sound a little like, ah, is pay the minimum require until you die. And you might be thinking, well, that's not like a good strategy. It may be a realistic strategy. And I, I already mentioned that a lot of my clients are looking into retirement or in retirement. If you're 67, 70, and it's going to take you another 20, 25, 30 years to repay your loan balance, do the math, you know, um, then at that point, you have to be okay with seeing your loan balance potentially grow and the fact that you're, you're going to die with this debt. The benefit of that is that um, it's dischargeable upon debt. So how do you determine the best, best path forward? Um, do math. Like there's a lot of online calculators where you can put in the total loan balance, the average interest rate that you have, and figure out how long is it going to take me to repay this debt. Try out what a uh, monthly payment you're comfortable with and see how long it's going to take you just to get a sense, right? And then figure out what your approach is going to be. Uh, you would have to explore different repayment, um, different forgiveness programs if you're trying to do the second option. Um, do some hypotheticals or, or pre and post retirement. Again, if this is all overwhelming and you need a sounding board, you can always reach out to us and we can help you. So let's say you decide to take off the, the first approach, which I've already discussed. Um, you want to, again, pay aggressively as much as possible, no prepayment penalty. The one thing that I'm going to caution you about, and sometimes it's appropriate, but rarely is, let's say you're down to your last 20,000 or 25,000. I'm not going to give a like a, 
I'm just giving you a ballpark number. Every situation is going to be different. And let's say your interest rate is 7.5% and you can get a loan out there for half of that. Well, maybe at that point you can explore whether getting a private loan to pay off the federal loan may be worth it. The big caution is once you leave the federal system, it becomes a private loan and you don't have access to the more generous repayment plan options and you don't have access to forgiveness program or any future relief the federal government may give. A big lesson of that was the payment costs during COVID, right? So be aware that in some rare instances, getting a private loan to pay off the high interest of a federal loan may be worth it for some people, but cautionary tale, once you leave the federal system, you no longer have those protections and all those other uh, potential relief options. Pursue a forgiveness cancellation or discharge program. All these terms mean the same thing. It's eliminating your student loan through a federal program. Um, the big one is public service loan forgiveness. So if you work for the government nonprofit, uh, you could potentially qualify for this. Um, make sure you have direct loans and the only repayment plan available to you if you're pursuing this program is the income contingent repayment plan. In order to get the income contingent repayment plan, you will need to consolidate your loans. I want to step back on this because I recently had a case that really like was a red flag for me. For public service loan forgiveness, there are technically two repayment plans that you're eligible for. There's a 10-year standard repayment plan. So if you don't consolidate your direct parent plus loans, you have the option of enrolling in the 10-year standard repayment plan. Now, technically, pre-COVID, like if you're enrolled in a 10-year standard repayment plan, you're going to be done repaying your loans prior to meeting the 10 years worth of credit required for public service loan forgiveness. So generally, we would say it would not make sense. Now, with COVID, if you're paying your loans and we're paying your loans under the 10-year standard repayment plan, you could continue repaying your loans under that plan when payments resume, and you may still have three years of payments that you can get rid of because the payment pause basically gave you three years of credit. I hope I'm making sense there. If I'm confusing you, I'm sorry. We can explain and meet up with you if needed. Now, that's if you're pursuing PSLF under the 10-year standard repayment plan. If you're not doing that and you still want to pursue public service loan forgiveness, you would then have to enroll in the income contingent repayment plan. In order to enroll in the income contingent repayment plan, you would need to consolidate your direct parent plus loans into a direct parent plus loan consolidation to access that repayment plan. I'm going to talk more about this. If you're pursuing PSLF, now is the time to take action. You would have to file an employment form um, in order to be able to um, kind of initiate the process if, and, and, and get that going. Uh, as a reminder, you are the one that is supposed to have the public service and meet the eligibility requirements. Common Parent Plus Loan PSLF challenges is kind of what I just said that, you know, if you are going to pursue the program, you either are paying under the 10-year standard and hopefully you have three years worth of credit that you can then just avoid three years of payments under the 10-year standard. If not, you're going to enroll in the income contingent repayment plan. The problem is that that plan, if you're making moderate to high income, may be cost prohibitive. And that is the number one reason why people may not finish public service loan forgiveness despite having some credit at this point. Um, it can be unaffordable for a lot of borrowers, so keep that in mind. Um, some other challenges is if you're thinking of retiring and you're not done with PSLF, well, then you're never going to finish the program. And PSLF is an all or nothing. You get your entire debt wipe after the 10 years of qualifying payments, but you don't get any partial credit. So some people may come to us and say, well, I'm retiring in one year and they may have three years left of PSLF. They're going to have to make a judgment call because the rule is that you still have to be employed full time by a qualifying employer at the time you submit the application. You don't have to wait to be approved, but we generally recommend people to be still employed to make sure everything is done and they get the actual forgiveness. Um, under the IDR account adjustment, people who consolidate can get retroactive credit for qualifying payments, and that is key. Last year, around this time, we couldn't do that. 
uh, the Department of Education came out in March saying we'll give retroactive credit. So if you need to consolidate to get access to the ICR, do it before December 31st. Now, this leads me to another forgiveness program. It's called the Income Driven Repayment Forgiveness. This is not tied to your type of employment or employment but you would still be required to enroll in the income contingent repayment plan. And this basically says that if you have parent plus loans and you pay under the income contingent repayment plan for 25 years, the remaining loan balance at that point is going to be forgiven. The only good thing or one of the big good things about right now is that you're going to get a credit from the time your parent plus loans enter repayment up until now even if you were not enrolled in the income contingent repayment plan. So as long as your loans were in repayment, um, you're going to get credit for that towards this 25 years. So it's possible if you have older parent plus loans that you may have some progress, meaningful progress towards this eventual forgiveness, the 25 year forgiveness. So as I mentioned or alluded already, there is a, an initiative right now, temporary one-time initiative called the IDR account adjustment that says if your loans were in repayment, for the most part, we'll give you credit towards both PSLF and IDR account adjustment. Um, as long as you were in repayment for PSLF, you still need to meet the full-time 30 hours per week working for a qualifying employer. And we're seeing a lot of success with this. Um, in fact, we're seeing a lot of uh, borrowers who also have Parent PLUS loans be close to or achieve forgiveness uh, because they're getting this extra credit, even if they were not in an income-driven repayment plan uh, before. Now, um, for IDRF, for the 25-year forgiveness, again, you would need to, uh, if you're not done with that, you would need to transition into an income contingent repayment plan, which it could be cost prohibitive, but you want to assess that as a possibility. You must, again, take advantage of this. If you need to consolidate, you would do it prior to the end of the year. I'm going to stop there and see if Nancy has anything else to add because that's like the most confusing thing right now. And I want to make sure that at least you get some clarity there. Nancy, any additional questions or feedback before I talk about TPD? Uh, so there are there are no questions, and I actually think um, you did a pretty comprehensive job of trying to explain the IDR account adjustment. I think no matter how often we explain it and how much we try to simplify it, it's never going to be a completely simple concept. Um, but as Carolina said, just know that if you've got loans with different repayment histories and you have the ability to uh, you do have the ability to combine them together before the end of the year and you would receive the longest repayment history applied to your entire consolidated balance, moving you closer to forgiveness. Great. But there are some there are also some uh, you know caveats and 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 um, that issues that you have to be aware of when you do that. So um, you want to reach out you want to reach out for help. Yeah, you if you need help consolidating or figuring that out, reach out. So total impairment and disability discharge, this I include in this section because um, if not now, maybe later. And this program basically says that you, you are disabled and the disability or the health condition is going to persist. And so there's a form, Nelnet manages this program. And just today, I was talking to a client who retired and was eight months short from PSLF with a loan balance. And I, I felt so bad for her because she's retired and, you know, going back and getting a job is not going to be possible, most likely. And then she said, hey, like I have some health conditions. And then that triggered total and permanent disability because she could qualify for this and get rid of her remaining loan balance. There's more information. You're going to get this PowerPoint. You can explore that. Um, it doesn't mean that you're like dying right now, but it does require some kind of health conditions that prevent you from engaging in, in work. Uh, if you're still working, chances are, um, you know, that, that may question your ability to qualify, although there's no more um, income requirement thresholds right now. But just be aware that this may be something to look into in the future um, should situations change for you. 
borrow a defense to repayment really quickly. If you paid for a dependence college and the college was kind of a fraud, meaning they were deceptive. They said, for example, like we have a bunch of scholarships, you're really not gonna have to take out many loans and then you end up with high loan balances. Uh, be aware for profits are probably the, the most involved in this. So basically the federal government through this program says, we know you went to a school def defrauded you, you apply online through studentaid.gov and you could potentially have those loans discharged even if you were the parent borrower. Obviously, it will be loans attributed to the school that you're claiming um, engage in fraudulent behavior. In summary, if you're pursuing a forgiveness program, make sure you fully understand the requirements. Keep in mind your retirement date um, because you want to make sure you're, gonna, you're aware whether you're going to complete the program if there is a, a timeline like PSLF or IDRF. Track your progress. If you have uh, Mojila and you're working towards PSLF, there's a tracker there. For IDRF, the 25-year forgiveness, FSA is going to have a tracking mechanism hopefully next year. So again, be aware of that. Regardless of the path you take, um, make sure you're enrolling the right repayment plan. If you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness or income-driven repayment forgiveness, remember you have to enroll in the one and only income-driven repayment plan called the income contingent repayment. Um, Know that you also have options uh, for other repayment plans under what we call traditional plans. Traditional plans are based on your loan balance, the interest rate, and a predetermined payback period. If you consolidate your direct parent plus loans, you can have up to 30 years to repay your, your parent plus loans. They are not based on your income. You do not have to renew traditional plans. You would call your servicer to enroll in a traditional plan. Traditional plans can be standard, meaning you make the same monthly payment for the 2025, 30 year period or graduated repayment plans where every two years your payment goes up. It starts you with a lower payment amount and then it goes up every two years. Um, the student loan simulator will be able to give you like an assessment of all these options. Again, uh, and when it comes to income-driven repayment plans, unfortunately, the safe plan is the new plan is not available for parent plus loan. Know that advocates are pushing back and trying to see if the Department of Education is going to change their mind on that because we think it's not fair. Um, you do have ICR, which can be, you know, high, um, but you should look into it, especially if you're pursuing a forgiveness program. I am not going to go into this because I already mentioned everything here. The big takeaway is if you want the ICR plan because you're pursuing a forgiveness program, you must have to you must have consolidated direct parent plus loans. Keeping your loans in good standing until the end of time. Again, that requires just enrolling in the most affordable repayment plan and just making sure that you renew it if you're enrolling in the ICR. If you're enrolling in a traditional plan, um, you don't really have to renew it every year. You just enrolled. And again, um, that's it. You enrolled and keep them in good standing. Um, avoid default until the end of time. If you have Parent PLUS loans or any loans in default, there's a new initiative called Fresh Start where it takes about 10 minutes, 15 minutes to make a call to the debt collector known as a default resolution group. Most of you, if you have defaulted loans, would be calling that number, the 800-621-3115. And you would basically call them and say, hey, I want to take advantage of Fresh Start and get my loans back in good standing. If your loans were in default during COVID, you could potentially get that time period uh, counted towards um, the forgiveness program. So it's a good time to take out loans out of default through Fresh Start. If you're going back to school, you could get them out of default by simply filing the PAFSA and enrolling in school. Private student loans. Uh, a lot less options. As I mentioned, if you have a private student loan, the lender is going to want their money and then your payment plan is going to be based on a predetermined payback period uh, based on your loan balance and, and, and interest rate. Um, there's no forgiveness options. Sometimes some lenders may have a disability option if you're disabled, but rarely. Um, co-signer release, it is nearly impossible to be released if you co-sign a private student loan because there's no incentive from the lender to release you. The only time when a lender is going to consider releasing you as a co-signer is when 
the student borrower who you co-signed for has a stable job. They can show that they can acquire the debt in full and they have a history of good payment. What ends up happening is that the student borrower graduates from school. It takes them a year or two to find a job or a stable job. And so they may fall behind or they may ask the lender for a forbearance. The moment you show or the student borrower shows any distress or inability to repay, forget about being released as a co-signer. They have no incentive whatsoever. The borrower already showed distress. Again, they had you co-sign knowing very well that just having the student borrower was a complete gamble. They will go after you like any other credit card debt. Um, the only benefit arguably about private student loans is that it is subject to a statute of limitations. There's a question of whether it's six years or three years in New York, um, but it's going to have a hit on your credit, credit report. And if you own assets like a home, um, they could technically go after you, sue you and put a lien on your home. So be aware of that. If you have issues with private loans and want to meet one-on-one -on -one to figure out where you're at and what, what is, if any, any strategy, we're happy to do that. Um, okay. What about bankruptcy? Extremely hard to discharge both federal and private student loans. They are pretty safeguarded when it comes to bankruptcy. A borrower has to show undue hardship. Undue hardship means that you basically cannot support and maintain a very basic standard of living if you have to repay your loans. And that is a condition that has persisted, will persist, persist now, and will continue to persist in the future. So um, usually it's hard to discharge loans in bankruptcy because people who meet the undue hardship probably qualify for a zero dollar repayment plan. Not always. Um, the federal government has been working with the Department of Justice who handles this type of bankruptcy proceedings to give more leeway, but again, it's still pretty hard. You will need to consult with a student loan bankruptcy attorney that knows the process because you would have to initiate a different adverse proceeding. If you're filing for bankruptcy, don't assume that your student loans are automatically part of that bankruptcy discharge. There is a, def a different proceeding that you would have to initiate. I'm going to stop there. This is pretty much the end of our presentation. And I feel like this was a record uh, speedy presentation. Here's our contact information if you need help. Uh, you're going to have access to a lot of the links that we've mentioned. Uh, I'm going to stop there to see if Nancy wants to add anything else and whether you have additional questions. We're happy to unmute you. We have a small group where we're happy to unmute you if you want to ask any questions directly.